So this video is all about irony. Irony that it would be the red-green colorblind man who would progenerate a myth about seeing green men on a red planet. It smells a little bit fishy. Today on Chromophobe, I'll be discussing the astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli and how his colorblindness convinced the world that Martians existed. And how for the price of a cup of coffee a day, even you could build a canal on Mars and make sure that Zorblax gets the fresh water that he needs. So you may recognize Schiaparelli as the name of the crater that Mark Watney had to reach in order to escape Mars in the book slash movie called The Martian. But the crater was so named because Schiaparelli was a giant of the late 19th century astronomy community. Now he was already well accomplished and highly decorated when in 1877, Schiaparelli turned his eyes to Mars. Citing a disappointment with the state of Martian cartography at the time, Schiaparelli began his own map from scratch, redefining all of the geographical features and renaming each one of them as he wished. The result was this map. Based on the foundation of 63 precisely measured reference points to avoid distortion, all of the features were defined geometrically and impeccably, which is exactly what you would expect from Schiaparelli, who graduated as a hydraulics engineer in 1854. Although the map does look like a piece of film melting in a projector, it's important to note that the process of recording maps of Mars in 1877 did not involve photography. It would be many decades still until photography could compete with the sensitivity or acuity of the human eye, so the human eye they used. Astronomers had to spend hours on end staring through their telescope at Mars, waiting for a few moments when the distortion caused by turbulence in Earth's atmosphere would dissipate and they would be able to clearly see Mars enough to sketch out a few of the elements of the planet's surface. It was physically taxing, especially on the eye, and during Mars oppositions, periods every two years when Mars was closest to Earth and therefore prime for viewing, Schiaparelli would avoid everything which could affect the nervous system, from narcotics to alcohol, and especially coffee, which he found to be exceedingly prejudicial to the accuracy of observation. And just let that sink in. An Italian giving up coffee for months on end. This guy was serious about Mars. But this method of manually illustrating the planet left a lot of room for interpretation. As the eminent resource for this topic, Mars historian William Sheehan described that drawings do not represent how the object appears through a telescope at any one time. They are rather a synthesis of very many observations. They represent a belief in what it is really like, not necessarily what is seen. First, let's take a look at Mars as Schiaparelli would have seen it at the time based on a similar telescope and viewing conditions. Many astronomers of the era, including Nathan Green and Frederick Kaiser, aimed to draw the planet as faithfully as possible, as a photograph would look, and they were able to owing to rich artistic backgrounds. On the other hand, the engineer Schiaparelli did not have quite an artistic flair when it came to these things because, as he said, my eye is strongly affected by Daltonism, thus it doesn't distinguish well the gradations of red and green colors. And yes, there are colorblind artists, but there are way more colorblind engineers. As one of the latter, Schiaparelli approached Mars as something that should be categorized and classified, and he approached his map more like a blueprint, something cast in hard and sharp lines. And this was clearly his intention. As he said, it is to be understood that I have not even approximately given a painting of the true appearance one expects of the planet. And you can really only expect a colorblind engineer to depict what he sees in this way. For example, as a colorblind engineer, here is a picture I painted of my daughter. Schiaparelli and other astronomers of the same school of thought were concerned with the definition of boundaries and with the categorization of regions and features named, of course, analogously to the forms that we have on Earth. As Schiaparelli said, Do not brevity and clarity induce us to use such words as island, isthmus, strait, channel, peninsula, cape, etc. After all, we speak in a similar way of the Maria of the Moon, knowing very well that they do not consist of liquid masses. Regardless, Schiaparelli was attacked. Now, it may be because his new naming convention completely wiped the names of his fellow astronomers off the map, but it was apparently for his over-interpretation of his observations, specifically when it came to the inclusion of the word canali, an Italian word that translates ambiguously into English as either channel or canal, which insinuates either a natural or an artificial feature, respectively. And this mistranslation is the compellingly simple and oft-retold theory 
of how we came to be duped into believing in Martians. But alas, we have to be careful. Rushing to believe the most compelling explanation is exactly the problem that the general population had in Schiaparelli's day when they believed that the Canali were proof that Mars is inhabited by a race of sentient humanoid life forms building canals desperate to stave off the desertification of their planet. But this whole mistranslation argument pretty much absolves Schiaparelli of all responsibility. And it's clear through his writings that he not only believed that they were canals, but that the canals were proof of alien life. As he said, these canali are probably the main mechanism by which water, and with it organic life, can spread on the dry surface of the planet. But it gets better. On his updated map two years later, based on his new observations of the next opposition of Mars, Schiaparelli claimed that the singular aspect of the canali, and their being drawn with absolute geometrical precision, as if they were the work of rule or compass, has led some to see in them work of intelligent life. I am very careful not to combat this supposition, which includes nothing impossible. Ah, Schiaparelli. Careful not to make any direct outlandish claims, but it's hard to say that he didn't take advantage of that double meaning of the word canali. Starting with his third opposition in 1881, Schiaparelli started to draw the canali as impossibly straight lines, making it clear that he absolutely intended these canali to be interpreted as engineering works. And to remove all doubt, in the midst of his retirement in the early 1890s, Schiaparelli wrote essays in which he mused on the nature of intelligent life on Mars, even to speculate about the most likely form of government that the Martian society would have, which, I mean, it's communism, right? The red planet, it's, it's communism. But the biggest problem for Schiaparelli was not that his critics thought the canali were natural, but that they doubted their existence completely. E.W. Monard noted that where I have represented shaded districts, Schiaparelli has drawn hard lines. Nathan Green, whose own 1877 map of Mars was based on his observations through a larger 13-inch telescope, thereby providing a generally more acute image than Schiaparelli, alleges that Schiaparelli had not drawn what he had seen, or in other words, had drawn indefinite pieces of shading into clear, sharp lines. And indeed, at first, no other astronomers could see the canali, but Schiaparelli doubled down, responding that it was as impossible to doubt the existence of the canali as it was to question the reality of the Rhine River. And with the insistence of this highly revered astronomer, and the ever-increasing clarity of his observations, his peers began to believe him, going so far as to feign that they saw the canali themselves. In fact, the inability to see the lines became a measure of the inexperience of the observer. So the number of those who claimed to have seen the lines increased, overcoming the initial skepticism. And this is possibly history's greatest example of the emperor's new clothes allegory. To his colleagues, Schiaparelli was considered to have an eye of tremendous acuity, despite having both Daltonism and myopia which is clearly the opposite of what you would expect people to say about a guy who is both nearsighted and colorblind. But perhaps there's some truth to this argument, you know? I mean, perhaps Schiaparelli was particularly good at detecting faint features on the surface of Mars. As he describes his method, in most cases, the presence of a canal is first detected in a very vague and indeterminate manner as a light shading which extends over the surface. This state of affairs is hard to describe exactly because we are concerned with the limit between visibility and invisibility. It was in one or other of these indeterminate forms that in 1877 I began to recognize the existence of the canali. It certainly doesn't give me the utmost confidence in his methods. Um, and in a tone that I can only ever read as sarcastic, uh, Mars historian William Sheehan explains... Obviously, Schiaparelli, abetted by colorblindness, had extraordinarily sensitive line detectors. Uh -huh. Faced with the sudden appearance of a feature at the threshold of vision, he had to decide what it was he saw. And his typical response was, oh, it's a line. So I gotta say, Schiaparelli and these canals, it's kind of starting to sound like a 12-year-old me staring at a TV tuned to Showtime, late at night, filled with static, and swearing I could make out a boob. Schiaparelli describes his perception of the planet as almost that of a chiaroscuro made with Chinese ink upon a general bright background. And this is a chiaroscuro painting 
obviously exhibiting way more contrast than any of us would ever describe Mars as having. So do colorblind people really have a higher sensitivity to contrast? Could a colorblind observer detect finer differences in albedo, that is, the reflectivity of a planetary surface? In Schiaparelli's time, the prevailing sentiment was yes, and as a result, much of the astronomy community came to trust his eye over their own. But almost a century later, this so-called superpower of the colorblind was rigorously tested and was shown to not exist. That the contrast discriminating ability of both colorblind and color normal individuals was identical. And yet, something nagged at me about these tests. I mean, they were all performed in grayscale, which meant that there was no color to essentially distract the color normals from seeing the differences in contrast. Pseudoisochromatic plates, such as the Ishihara test or the Mosaic test, use luminance-based noise to obfuscate the hue-based signal, that is, hide the shape or number. If this luminance noise were not there, then colorblind users would possibly be able to tell the difference between two colors of confusion based on the contrast and luminance between them alone. So what happens when I reverse this concept and add color-based noise to a luminance-based signal? Well, maybe that extra color would be enough to obfuscate that contrast from color normals, yet still allow colorblind individuals to see it. So I was preparing to guinea pig my wife again, obviously, and I was having some trouble defining some of the nuances with the experimental design when a paper fell into my lap, published literally only weeks before I was writing this script. This 2020 paper from Nature showed that when color-based noise was added to a contrast test, the ability of color normals faltered, whereas that of protans and dutans, like Schiaparelli and myself, remained strong, essentially yielding a reverse Ishihara test. Meaning, yes, Schiaparelli could have indeed had a finer ability to pick out lines from the surface of Mars, assuming that Mars is a particularly colorful planet and instead of being known for its you know, one unitary uh, color. But is Mars really red? Now, now bear with me for a second, because in 1877, spectroscopy, that is the measurement of colors, was still a few decades off, and so color was never quantitatively defined, it was only qualitatively defined by one's eye. We now know that both the light and dark regions of Mars are indeed quantitatively red, defined by their spectra. However, the color normal astronomers of the day would often describe features on Mars as having colors like greens, yellows, browns, blues, or even greenish indigo gray, which is a, a straight up abomination of a color. The perception of these phantom colors on the red planet comes from two factors, both of which Schiaparelli would have been largely immune to. First, chromatic aberration, which is the effect of a lens having a refractive index as a function of wavelength, which is a fancy way of saying accidental pink floating. The effect is that the colors in the image are slightly offset from one another. The effect is clearly depicted in this amateur image of Mars, where there are purple and green fringes on opposite extremes of the planet. However, even less blatant distortions of color can be seen in the middle of the planet. Second, recall that Mars observers would stare at the planet for hours when drawing it. This leads to an effect called color constancy, where your eye and your brain will compensate for the overall red tint of an image essentially subtracting a little bit of red from your perception. This is essentially the same when your eyes white balance your perception when you put on color tinted sunglasses, which owners of Enchroma's bright pink lenses will definitely be familiar with. Subtraction of the red from one's vision allows the observers to pick up on the nuances of the greenish indigo gray hues that would otherwise be swallowed up by the red if the observer was only looking at the planet briefly. Differences between these specific hues, the greens, reds, browns, and grays, would all essentially be invisible to Schiaparelli. So according to the 2020 Nature paper, Schiaparelli would have indeed had a better contrast discrimination ability than his peers, and therefore they were right to have trusted him in retrospect. And it's not like lines on Mars was such a ridiculous idea with the information that they had. I mean, just look at the true form of Europa. There are huge straight lines crisscrossing the surface of Jupiter's moon. The only difference is that when we discovered these lines, we called them lines, not highways. My criticism is therefore not that astronomers trusted that Schiaparelli saw the lines, 
but just the wanton speculation on alien civilizations that ensued. And those most vocal supporters of Schiaparelli's theories were truly a band of unscrupulous, sycophantic fanboys. By 1890, after a total of six oppositions of Mars, Schiaparelli was drawing his canals as finer and finer features to a point where they were so small they should have been theoretically impossible to distinguish with the telescope that he was using. Many of his fanboys drew even finer maps based on Schiaparelli's data consisting of canals, hundreds of them crisscrossing the surface of Mars. By 1894, Schiaparelli admits that his vision has been deteriorating for years and that he is retiring. But his fanboys were not. The worst offender was pretty boy heir to a rich family and dude who should really get more shit for what he did had his observatory not eventually discovered Pluto, Mr. Percival Lowell. Lowell, who was more astrologer than astronomer, immediately clung on to this extraterrestrial idea, betting his entire reputation on it. He wrote articles describing the weather, geography, and agriculture of Mars, even going so far as to muse on the biology of Martians. Now these claims are obviously purely speculative, i.e. made up bullshit, but while Lowell was largely derided by professional astronomers, his articles were published in popular magazines for laymen, i.e. popular science and popular astronomy. Later, he wrote best-selling books such as Mars and its Canals and Mars as the Abode of Life. He also traveled across America giving sold-out talks to universities and societies where he would espouse his ideas that the canals were built for irrigation by an intelligent civilization. In the end, he was wildly incorrect but he became a popular American icon, and to his credit, he popularized Mars in a way that only an icon can. Probably my favorite part about Lowell was his Elon Muskian dream to embark on a red safari to that other island across the blue, so much so that he wrote a poem about it. Against hope hoping that mankind may in time invent some possible way for that longed for born, that while I gaze through the heaven's heaving haze, seems in its shimmer to nod me nay. Ah, Dear Percival Lowell, You made shit up, there is no doubt, because fame is what you were all about. Canals and Martians ne'er perceived were your ammunition to deceive, you lousy cretin, you sleazy lout. Sincerely, Protan. In the 19th century, just like today, the key to becoming a popular scientist wasn't about being a genius, or even correct. It was about being loud and compelling. And what is louder and more compelling than a colorblind guy finding Martians? In 1909, advances in spectrometry allowed scientifically inclined observers to prove that Mars had very little atmosphere with no water in it, essentially debunking the whole life on Mars claim. And in 1965, Mariner 4 took the first close-up images of Mars seeing only sparse craters where Schiaparelli had seen his lines. Now, for the most part, historians do believe that Schiaparelli actually saw lines and wasn't just making it up. Now, one theory states that the lines could have derived from real dust storms on the planet. However, another theory states that Schiaparelli was simply seeing and drawing shadows of the capillaries in his retina. As a colorblind guy, I, I want to root for Schiaparelli. I, I want the lines to represent something physical. I want him to show that color deficient vision has an advantage, that it has value, and that he was able to see the lines due specifically to his condition. But as a scientist, I can only condemn his completely flippant speculations of intelligent life and his unwillingness to rein in his followers. In the end, if Schiaparelli were not colorblind, then maybe he would not have drawn such a schematic representation of the planet's surface. Maybe people would not have trusted that his eye had such a tremendous acuity, and maybe he would have just grown up to be a professional flower arranger. In any case, if it weren't for Schiaparelli, we would have never reached this public Mars hysteria in the early 20th century that drove a generation to look towards the skies. This is Chromophobe.